ಓಂ ದೃಶ್ಯಮಾನ ನಗರಿ ತುಲ್ಯನ್ನಿಜಾಂತರ್ಗತ ಪಶ್ಯನ್ನಾತ್ಮನಿ ಮಾಯ ಬಹಿರಿವೋದ್ಭೂತ ಯಥಾನಿದ್ರಯ ಯಾತ್ ಕುರು ಪ್ರಬೋಧ ಸಮೇ ಸ್ವಾತ್ಮಾನಮೇವಾ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ಬೀಜಸ್ಯಾಂತರಿವಾಂಕುರೋ ಜಗದಿದ ಪ್ರಾಂಕಲ್ಪ ಪುನಃ ಮಾಯಕಲ್ಪಿತೇಶಕಾಲಕಲ ವೈಚಿತ್ರಚಿತ್ರೇ ಕೃತ ಮಾಯಾವೀವ ವಿಜೃಂಭಯತ್ಯಮಹಾಯೋಗೀ ವಯಸ್ವೆಚ್ಛಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀಗುರುಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ಓಂ ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತ ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಂಭಾಂ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ದ ವೇದ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಡೆಫಿನೇಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಪ್ರಮಾಣ ಅಪ್ಲೈಸ್ ವೆರಿ ವೆಲ್ ಟು ವೇದ ಆಲ್ಸೋ and that part we are discussing and very important also to discuss this so once you know what veda can give you what veda can uh, i mean be helpful to you once it is clear and it cannot be known what what the knowledge which is given by the veda cannot be known through any other means and knowledge is very very useful etc if one becomes clear then your your shraddha increases in the pramana just as your shraddha already is established in your sense organs and therefore you are able to get things uh, done through the sense organs so many things you are able to do same way veda also serves a purpose for you and so if your shraddha is well established then uh, definitely the advantage you get uh, by operating those means of knowledge especially the veda will be very much so we have to understand and that's how we are discussing this particular pramana of course pujya swami ji discusses it in a great length any time when he gets a chance he was getting a chance he used to discuss this pramanatvam of the veda at a at a at a, at a um, very elaborately i mean he was discussing anyways so veda is a pramanam for both the section i mean uh, for both the gnanam karma gnanam and uh, atma gnanam and uh, in karma gnanam i mean of course when it talks about heaven and other things devatas and punya papas etc one sim- uh, one has to accept it simply i mean one has to simply accept it without any doubt and well uh, that is why even the mimamsa etc that means analysis of the words become very very important so veda being a basically a, a, a shabda pramana <coughs> one should not bring one's own uh, subjectivity one's own conclusion into the veda one has to understand what veda says as it is when people interpret when veda talks about swarga people uh, here so called intellectuals and rationals they interpret in their own way what swarga is what naraka is they say most uh, you know the situation which provides you lot of cushion etc is swarga and uh, the situation which is very very uncomfortable very adverse it is naraka there is no swarga and naraka um, other than that and even so many acharyas interpret that way they talk even publicly also that shows that uh, you don't have a shraddha in the veda veda says there is a lo- there is a particular loka called swarga etc then definitely we have to take it as it is and therefore uh, uh, i mean we cannot interpret in our own way what veda says so one must be highly dispassionate to gain you know that kind of an understanding one must have a very much one must have a lot of shraddha in that for those words only then uh, what uh, uh, only then one can understand what veda has to say so uh, one should not uh, otherwise uh, the tendency will be there if that shraddha is not there one can twist the meaning uh, uh, to one's own liking etc 
and people like this kind of a meaning because here we have to simply believe what Veda says and instead if, if you interpret like that they like that kind of a speaker because they see how beautifully he interpreted uh, you know Swarga and Naraka and everything well it is totally wrong thing to do that and uh, so a speaker may have that kind of a liking to draw the attention of the pub public and you know to draw a large crowd and by interpreting the Veda in its own way well it's a dangerous thing to do one should not do one should have a total dispassion whatever Veda says it's a pramana it, whatever data it gives that's correct just as the data provided my eyes my ears I have no have, I have no question whatever it is and the same way here also uh, will they are all apaurushe vishaya the subject matter is basically uh, apaurushe which is not available to me through my senses etc well therefore whatever veda says i will have to accept it and uh, in in fact uh, in uh, you know the acharyas were uh, i mean uh, uh, um, vedic acharyas of course well they to avoid this kind of twisting they have evolved a very high uh, very highly evolved system of uh, analysis of words and uh, in the process definitely we call it that mimamsa and in the process we come to analyze and correct the you know our habitual way of interpreting habitual way of wrong thinking habitual way of interpreting depending upon my own likes and uh, uh, here the, especially in mimamsa etc they always go by what was said earlier what what is said later all these things has been taken into account upakrama upasamha we have also system a method of analysis upakrama upasamharo abhyasa purvata phalam arthavado papatishya lingam tatparye lingam tatparye etc so these are the shadlingas are there i mean six ways of interpreting and uh, so there is there should not be any contradiction so far as these are the ways how we how veda becomes a pramana so if the earlier and later statements well have to be meaningful well there should be no contradiction and that's how what you find in the upakrama and what you find in the at the end of course later statements will have a uh, consistency and it is there in fact brahma sutra's first uh, uh, the whole chapter has been devoted to this consistency consistency between all upanishads very very difficult job very difficult job even in a single Upanishad you don't find a consistency if you if you just uh, translate the mantras as it is after translation please check a single Upanishad translate all as it is literal translation you find it doesn't make a sense and there you find some contradictions also and then you, if you open another uh, Upanishad and then you find there is a contradiction between two Upanishads then you find a contradiction between the Veda and the Smriti like Bhagavad Gita and uh, Upanishad so many things are there and Vyasacharya did a great job it's a very very enormous task I would say well he showed the Samanvaya the consistency between all the Shruti Vakyas to resolve the doubt pertaining it's, there, it's not a actually, means there is no contradiction but you may have a doubt well then he he uh, resolved those, those doubts through this kind of a thing and it, the first that's how the first chapter is called Samanvaya Adhyaya anyway and in ascertaining the meaning of the of course the words of mantra etc um, definitely grammar is the first thing the essential thing but grammar gives you a literal meaning then you definitely require semantics by which you, are, you you look into the whole sentence. See, the word has a one meaning. When word employed in the sentence, it has a different meaning. We should understand very well. As I told you, you know, we have done that. <laughs> Pakistan as such has a one meaning. But when Pakistan uh, was defeated, that sentence you make then, it has a different meaning. Then you cannot take the country was defeated. Here the cricket team was defeated. I mean, so a word employed in the uh, a sentence will give you different meaning. And sometimes you will have to think logically. Or, I mean, you should have a logic behind to give, to ascertain a meaning. If you, you may give in a sentence any meaning, but it doesn't fit into the 
logic of the whole uh, sentence. If you keep that meaning, of course, the meaning of the whole sentence becomes different. And therefore, you should uh, uh, definitely, uh, I mean, give a meaning properly. So all this semantics is involved, linguistics is involved, grammar is involved. And well, definitely, um, they have analyzed, the Acharyas have analyzed. That's how they call, we call them Puro Mimamsaka. Mimamsa means a method of analysis of the words. And they have a very evolved method of analysis. And through that, they have given a, a, a I mean, a proper meaning to the entire sections of the Veda. And therefore, then, then we are not uh, supposed to twist. Or here in America, they call spin. You spin the whole whole thing. You, do, should, you need not spin the thing. I mean, we should take it as it is. Don't interpret loka, swarga loka, etc. Like a, a proper country or proper situation. Or somebody says, my house is a swarga. We have all harmony here and very, very comfortable environment, etc. And so therefore, Swami, this is swarga. What else swarga I can believe? Yeah, okay, no problem. Don't believe. So this is how people take it. We have to take literally that there is a swarga loka. There are devatas, there are punya papas, as, as it is we have to accept without any kind of a twist. And moreover, one more thing that is most important is, well, before you interpret, you know, human, human experience also pressed into the service. And you can understand very well in the Upanishad, all the time we say, the whole Upanishad gives this knowledge of Brahman, etc. We definitely take into account our own experiences like Jagrat Avastha, Sapna Avastha, Sushupti Avastha, I know other than that also. What happens to, you know, in a moment of joy, what happens, etc, etc. So we analyze properly. But taking into the human experience, accepting the human experience, and therefore there is no question of believing as it is. When a human experience is taken into account and analyzed properly, then there is a question of giving some new meaning. And therefore, uh, so whole this thing uh, makes uh, makes us an uh, whole this thing makes us understand that we have to take whatever is there in the Veda as it is, and I should have a shraddha and being a dispassionate totally uh, that uh, I don't have any kind of agenda behind giving a new meaning or twisting the meaning etc. I should not have any agenda, and well, the Veda should not contradict itself. It should not contradict human experience and uh, nor should it contradict any knowledge you gain through the um, other valid means of knowledge. It should not contradict uh, perception. So uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. It contradicts your perception. <laughs> it contradicts perception. Perception says um, there is Dvaitam duality and uh, you, you, uh, you and your Veda says that it is all Advaitam. But who says that perception proves Dvaitam? First prove, perception, perception proves Dvaitam. Please tell me how you prove it. Perception reveals uh, various names and forms. It doesn't prove duality. Duality is proved here. Duality is proved here. Ah. Just, just because you see many parts does not mean that there are many things. Yeah, just because you see varieties in the ornaments, varieties, lacks of a variety, I mean, uh, uh, kind of uh, ornaments are there. It doesn't mean that they are really many. So perception reveals names and form. Perception does not prove duality. Never. In fact, Pujya Swamiji has proved perception reveals non-duality. We have gone to one, one, one stand, I mean, one step further. But where, where, where? So, <laughs> we have already discussed this Tattva Bodha. And so in case if you feel that, no, 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 Swamiji, I, I don't remember, I want it. Then I will give you a page number later. I'm, I will give you on Monday. Uh, right now, because to search, I mean, it may take two, three, four minutes. But I, we have also discussed that perception proves non-duality. Really? Really? All names and forms are proven by perception. And if all the names and forms are not there at all, how will you prove non-duality? Basically, like, forget about any other thing. I will give you our own example. You are seeing me right now, right? And um, this is an experience. And that is a perception, okay? Sensory perception. And when you are seeing. Now, basically, you are, you are, a, you are, a, you are a seer. I am seen. And uh, there is a, there is a vritti. 
Darshan Vritti. I mean, I thought, basically all these three prove that there is one consciousness. How will you please prove the seer without consciousness? That's all. Please prove a object of seeing without consciousness. Please prove. Try. No one dares to that. Do, to do that. Will please prove the thought of seeing. Right? The seeing takes place in the mind. Please prove without consciousness. Please prove it. I mean all the three has a basis in what? One consciousness. So perception proves non-duality. But Swamiji, there are, okay, your consciousness is there. Your consciousness is there. And, uh, <laughs> and then seer and uh, seeing and object of seeing also are there. But I am seeing you that seer is there. Consciousness is there. And seer is not there. Consciousness is there. I am telling you, Without consciousness, prove the seer. Without consciousness, prove the object of seeing. Without consciousness, prove the existence of thought. Please prove. Then your, your seer, seen, etc. are independent and my consciousness is independent. These three, all the three are just superimposition. They are all, uh, they are all superimposition upon one consciousness. They are mithya. How can you say they are mithya? Yeah, your seer is not there, still my consciousness is there. Your object of seeing is not there, still my consciousness is there. And your uh, so-called object, I mean thought of seeing is also not there, still my consciousness is there. Who is Satyam and what is, what is Satyam and what is mithya? Please tell me. Pot is there, my clay is there. Your pot is not there, my clay is still there. What is Satyam? What is Satyam? What is superimposition upon the clay? Because a seer can never be proved without consciousness. Object of seeing cannot be proved without consciousness. A thought of seeing cannot be proved without consciousness. Consciousness is proved by consciousness. And therefore perception reveals non-duality that there is one consciousness which is Satyam, which is Abhaditam. Very, very simple, very ingeniously Puja Swamiji proved it. So perception reveals duality. Who says though? You do not have a thinking basically. That's a problem. If you think little bit in the light of Vedanta and if you have the Shraddha, definitely you cannot, uh, you cannot, it, it, it will never be a thing that you cannot arrive at a duality, non-duality. If you think properly, you will arrive at non-duality. In fact, duality is just words. Simply words. Duality is merely a concept. Dvaitam is a concept. It's a notion. It has no reality other than the words. It has no reality other than the words. It, and therefore, there is non-duality throughout. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of examples are there. Now, many things means there are there is a duality, manyness. It's not so. Many things, one, one uh, uh, even though there are many things, in reality it is one alone. And therefore, this is uh, I mean anyway. So, uh, so Veda, what Veda should not talk, uh, uh, which is contradictory to the perception. And if it really does not talk, with, which is contrary to the perception we should not worry about other pramanas because all the other pramanas are basically based on perception. Perception is a very, very important thing. And so if uh, Veda does not contradict perception itself, then there is no question that uh, Veda contradicts in inference and presumption, etc. No way. And therefore, the analysis determining the meaning that does not contradict we is called Mimamsa. Could you follow? Now, so you take the you take a mantra of a Upanishad and analyze properly, and you will find that this non-duality is right. So you have to analyze properly the words, and therefore grammar uh, has a one role. Grammar gives you uh, and, uh, grammar always helps you in giving a direct meaning, but then semantics etc. All then definitely we will have to take into account implied meaning etc. Because in a given sentence, semantics means 
a, a word has a, uh, a, a different meaning or a proper meaning in a sentence. Grammar independently gives the meaning of the word. Like Pachakaha, if I say Pachakaha. Well, Pach Dhatu means to cook. Okay, Pachakaha, I have added Aka. Pacha plus Aka. And Aka Pratya is always in the sense of agency. Agency. I mean, one who does that. One who does cooking. Okay, so Pachakaha means a cook. Simple, ho gaya. That's a different thing. Now the Pachaka word is used in a sentence. There, of course, keeping in the whole uh, meaning of the sentence, we have to give the meaning to the each word. And that may differ. That may differ. That there, oh, you know, the Gaunartha also come, figurative all meaning can come, implied meaning can come, etc, etc. And which fits logically into the sentence. So the semantics, etc. are very, very important. And uh, therefore, all this is a part of Mimamsa. All this is part of Mimamsa. Lakshana, what we, Lakshana we do, etc. In a, in a Mahavakya. Definitely, it involves that. So anyway, so now coming back to the difference between this uh, Karma Jnanam and, I mean, the two sections of the Veda. The knowledge given by the Karmakanda is certainly going to be indirect. The words talking about heaven give rise to knowledge with, that is bound to be Paroksha. We have, this is, even though the whole Veda is a body of knowledge, but you know, uh, the knowledge uh, both, I mean, the, which is given by the both sections are different kind of a knowledge. One gives the indirect knowledge, one gives the immediate knowledge. So the definitely the earlier section of the Veda, I mean, the Karmakanda gives you knowledge regarding anything, regarding Devata, regarding, uh, regarding uh, Punyapapam, regarding our, um, I mean, Swarga, etc. All this is all indirect. And we, we, we say also further, Nitya Aparoksha Jnana. Nitya, Nitya Paroksha Jnana. I'm sorry. Nitya Paroksha Jnana. Nitya Paroksha Jnana. It means it will remain forever a indirect knowledge. We remain forever means what? Because suppose if, I, if after death, I have done good karmas and then definitely I will go to uh, heaven. Then it is not Paroksha. Heaven is not Paroksham for me. Heaven becomes Pratyaksham. That's correct. But in a human life, I'm talking. As a human being, and whatever the means of knowledge, etc. are given to you, well, you cannot prove a Swarga, etc. That is one thing. And when you operate a means of knowledge called Veda, especially the Karmakanda, it will give you the knowledge about Devatas, Punyapapas, and Swarga, etc. Well, but still it will be indirect knowledge throughout the human life. Throughout the human life, you will never come across any Devata. You will never come across Punya Papa. You will never come across Sarga. So now knowledge that the performance of a, a given ritual will give me Punya etc. Which will turn into heaven is purely Paroksha Jnana. And Puja Swami is generally called Paroksha Jnana means Shraddha. So it is Shraddha that because it is Paroksha. Then still you consider it as a true means what? <laughs> right? So and you I mean that there is a Swarga and taking it um, faithfully, you perform also certain karmas here so that you, because you want to go. So it's purely Shraddha. Anyway, born of Veda, but definitely it is Shraddha means not with, with a pending discovery. You know very well all this we discuss. You know, it's a just, uh, I mean, a, I believe with a pending discovery. I believe right now, but then pending discovery means uh, later on it, it will be proved. When I will go to Swarga, definitely it will be it will become a proof for me that yes, there is Swarga, etc. Of course, you don't call anybody or what do a WhatsApp. Okay, I have reached. Uh, don't worry about it <laughs> about me. I have I have done a lot of rituals, etc. And I have reached to the Swarga now. I am enjoying. Don't worry about me. Don't don't do any kind of Gmail email to me. I am very very happy. Never inquire about me, etc. <laughs> anyway, so it is Shraddha. I mean, it works with Shraddha. That's how we say Veda becomes fruitful for the people who have Shraddha. Even Atma Jnanam requires tremendous Shraddha because you believe till pending discovery, of course. But it's a different knowledge which I am going to talk. It's a different knowledge, but initially you will have to believe. Shastra says you are Brahman and I should believe. That's how they have included Shraddha in Sadhan Chatushta itself. <laughs> Guru Vedanta Vakkeshu Vishwasaha Shraddha. Everywhere you find this, without Shraddha, you cannot, uh, I mean, uh, go further. So, uh, well, so I have Shraddha for it. 
and uh, then uh, so when words whether they are you know from a a given person or from an enlightened person or I mean who is vedika etc and uh, or from the veda itself well talk about an object that is away from me the knowledge gathered would be we call it as a paroksha but if object is just you if object is away from you and uh, you know talked by veda well uh, definitely you require shraddha and that is an indirect knowledge of object of the uh, object but then if the object is just you which is already self evident means you need not have to operate any means of knowledge to prove and then uh, the knowledge will be aparoksha when uh, veda talks about you the pramata and which is self evident to you even you don't require veda also for that to prove the existence of that that is self evident what is self evident is means evident to yourself it is all you don't require any means of knowledge uh, for being an evident that is self evident and therefore self evident um, or self existence also you can say self existent you need not have to go to any means of knowledge you need not have to resort to any means of knowledge to prove the existence of the self self is sufficient to prove its existence it doesn't it is not dependent on any, any means of knowledge that is what we call it as a self existence self existence of the self is proven by the self i am that's all we what means of knowledge no means of knowledge in fact um, first i am is essential then other all other means of knowledge comes to operation right then mind also comes to operation senses comes to operation etc anyway so the knowledge will be a paroksha gnana immediate knowledge so um, if the object is just you which is self evident and still about that you if veda has to say something which is very very helpful to you and which you cannot gain through any other means of knowledge and that's how that portion of the veda becomes a pramana also and then definitely um, well uh, this kind of a knowledge will be aparoksha gnana and that is you are brahman etc is a aparok is a paroksha gnana so here the subject matter is just you and uh, the nature uh, as the very nature of the sort i mean brahman you are the brahman that is sort you are the seeker as such so you should be interested in because what you are seeking in your life means the what is sought is nothing but you that's what veda says so it is very important so brahman is said to be the subject matter because you happen to be brahman or you are the subject matter let's say that way you are the subject matter but uh, it is revealed that you are brahman what you are seeking you the seeker what you are seeking what is sought in your life is you very very essential all our efforts go you know all of our efforts from day morning to evening so much efforts it they just go away only i require a one lazy boy chair and one cup of coffee <laughs> nothing else nothing else require see how much how and then still you will have a more gain compared to all the people who are striving and striving day in and day out they are after 60 years the person doesn't get that much you will gain by sitting in a lazy boy chair with a cup of coffee that's all because what you are seeking is just yourself that's how it is it's amazing thing it's amazing thing but people are searching everything people are searching fearlessness people are searching um, limitlessness people are searching happiness people are searching peace people are searching all kinds of freedom from di- discomfort and this and that sadness and all these you abba therefore i require to sit now put a break on the legs and um, require to sit and have at least a french um, puja sabji kals you know one cup will may not be enough of a coffee okay every two words take one more cup another one hour another cup but just sit and listen but swami ji i am not able to sit that's why karma yoga is there sir don't worry ha ah, ah, ha it's it's not that simple i'm just joking it's not that simple to sit simply sitting swami you know that simply sitting swami is not simple really to sit is not simple our own ragadveshas 
will not allow to sit. It's very difficult. So ragadveshas has to be handled properly. At least they, they, they what they, um, I mean what you say they believe. They will not um, all the time, uh, I mean have a hold over you. Karma yoga is essential, and karma yoga is impossible without karma. Yeah, karma is possible without karma yoga, but karma yoga is impossible without karma. And therefore, karma has a role. And then jnana, of course, is. So karma and jnana serves the purpose of everything. And anyway, but the people who have really have gained the capability of, um, 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 I mean, uh, of, uh, you know, becoming free from the their own ragadveshas. And so basically their minds are free from the agitations, etc. And more or less this kind of a binding desires. They can definitely sit down. That is how the sannyasa is there. The pe then people can relieve. They are relieved by the society, by the shastra. That's a shastra sanction. Sannyasa is a shastra sanction. And then definitely they can sit and, and ponder on this self. So the knowledge of course in the end portion of the Veda is immediate. Unlike the knowledge of the Karmakanda. Karmakanda is knowledge, whatever the knowledge given by the Karmakanda is the indirect knowledge, Parokshanyanam, and whatever is given by the Vedanta, of course, is the immediate knowledge. Now, this Aparokshanyanam given by the Vedanta, he, uh, you know, uh, he, I mean, it uh, is uh, also called, Vedanta is called Upanishad, and the uh, word Upanishad means Atmagnanam, and that is, that, that is Falavat. So, that we will show it, that word Upanishad has both the components of the definition of pramana that we will see that. So Upanishad is a basically a descriptive word with a two upasargas, upa and ni. Upa plus ni is one part and sad is another part. That's all we will have to do. And when you combine that sad becomes shad. Because of that ikara in the previous uh, word, na plus e, upa ni. So na plus e is there. Because of that e, it's a Panini's rule. Because of that E, the Sakara turns to Shakara, Murdhanya. Anyway, but Sad is, a, is a basically a Dhatu or a root, which is uh, not used as a, of course, a word. And therefore, you will have to convert, um, when you use a word, it's a definitely Upanishad is a word, right? It's not a Dhatu, it's not a root. So, but the Sad is a root, then convert into word, then only you can put together. Like Kumb, uh, you know, our um, uh, pit, Pitambar, suppose a word. So you make a Samasa that Pitam plus an Ambaram, but both are words. There is no root there. Anyway, so what I am saying, this is here not a Samasa, but when you form a word, I mean, they are all components, uh, we'll have to think properly what are those components. So Sad is basically a root, and you will have to convert into a word. Then Upanishad becomes a word. So it remains as a Dhatu only. So, and then you apply that zero affix. Pujya Sami's word, it is zero affix. Kip. Kip Pratya you add. Then Sad root becomes now. Kip is a zero. Zero means it doesn't, uh, when when it does a job and when it leaves, it, then it doesn't, there is no trace behind. But they convert the Dhatu into a word. And definitely, uh, it will make this dhatu into an agent of an action. We and uh, agent of what? But agent of the well uh, indicated by the root meaning. So the root reveals a sad, you know, sad dhatu reveals that it is visharanam, means it is wearing out, gamanam means reaching, knowing, etc., and avasadhanam means putting an end to. And therefore, uh, when you add quip, becomes an agent. Then agent of what? Agent of wearing out agent of uh, taking you somewhere, agent of putting an end to, etc, etc. So this is how it is. Okay, but what is it that does uh, this action? You are saying that agent does this action. Uh, but what is that agent? Who is that agent which who, we, uh, uh, who does this job of wearing out? Who does the job of uh, taking you somewhere or reaching you? I mean, uh, or who does this job of putting an end to? What is that agent? Well, Upani is agent. Upani. Upani is agent which does the job of this. And therefore, 
that is indicated by the two pre prefix upa and ni. And upa means something near, of course. And uh, well, well, near is, of course, Brahman is very near, uh, right? We never separate from you. So it is you. Of course, it is looked upon something to be gained, something, I mean, it is a sort, but definitely it is you. And therefore, definitely, then, uh, therefore, I should know it. So if Brahman is me, what separates me from Brahman is basically ignorance. Because Brahman is non-separate from me, but still I am seeking. As if it is a separate from me, therefore it's a question of an ignorance. And therefore, basically, uh, this Upani, Upa, Upa means which is near and Brahman is most near, which is non-separate from me. And therefore, Upa indicates Brahman. And so, the very one which is sought after in my life. And then Ni. Ni means Nishya Jnanam. There is no need of writing Nishya Jnanam. Jnanam means which is, which is ascertained properly. That is only called Jnanam. Otherwise, it will be a doubt. So, why Nishya? Ni means Nishya Jnanam, you are saying. Because that knowledge, uh, you know, that Brahman is myself, should be a clear knowledge. So, Ni means, uh, of course, uh, Jnanam. But it should be clear. Why clear? Because you know the, this kind of a jnanam is given by Mahavakya. Mahavakya tells you that Brahman is non-separate from you or you are Brahman. But then that Mahavakya reveals something. Uh, I mean Mahavakya, uh, if I don't analyze properly, then it, this Mahavakya is not an equation for me. Because basically Mahavakya tells you are Brahman. You are Brahman. Then I and Brahman I cannot equate properly. I and Ishwar I cannot equate properly because I have lots of doubts. Because uh, when I look at myself, I don't find that I am Brahman. I am the one who is subject to birth and death. I am subject to Pudne Papam, etc. I am having so many limitations. I am limited in knowledge, limited in power. All the way limited, limited, limited. And Brahman means limitless everywhere. If you, if you say Brahman means Ishwara, well, then definitely, still everything, he is a Sarvagnya, Sarva Shakti man, everything. On his Karma Faladata and his Antaryami, he is this and he is a creator of the entire universe and sustainer and resolver. And well, I, I find I am a created. And all this, so I am a creature. He is a creator. So all, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. And therefore, it requires a lots of analysis. Lots of analysis. Why, why, Swami, you are saying lots of analysis? Even after listening to Mahavakya for 15 years, still I am not ready to accept. Swami, I am not Brahman. People will say that. Puja Swami described it very well. I am not Brahman. So, somehow it doesn't, it doesn't uh, percolate into me. This Jnana does not percolate into, into me. Therefore, it, Ni is very essential. Ni means a clear understanding. Nishay Jnanam means clear understanding is essential. It is not simple even though three words are there, Tattva Masi. What is uh, sought after by me in life is the very nature of you seeker. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense me, to me. And therefore, basically, Tattva Masi and, and you know the Padartha etc. also, I mean just a literal meaning. Tat means that Ishwara and Tvam means you. That means that, uh, that which is uh, sought after and Tvam means the seeker. How can the seeker is a sought? That is impossible. Then uh, if the seeking itself is, is not possible. If seeker is the sought, how the seeking takes place? Therefore sought should be uh, other than the seeker, right? <laughs> what is sought after by you must be different from you. How can you say it is you? So it is not simple. And therefore, it, it requires a clear understanding. Ni, stand, ni is okay, proper. Okay, I am Brahman, I don't know. And therefore, ignorance is a problem. Everything I know. And therefore, knowledge is required, I know. But Ni shows a clear understanding through Mahavakya, of course. But then, a lot of inquiry has to be done, vichara has to be done. The whole pramana, in the, once you enter into um, Vedanta, basically, the whole pramana pursuit is is with they call it as a vicharatmika means in the form of inquiry and analysis nothing else and therefore one has to gain the asset because this thing why puja swamiji was telling you know many many people our sadhakas believe this study etc attending class and all this 
will give a, a theoretical knowledge. They have this kind of a thing. And then, uh, you know, uh, um, well, we will gain a practical knowledge by doing, sitting in a samadhi or whatever, whatever in their ways, whatever they think of. The knowledge itself is a result they, that is impossible to understand. Very knowledge is the liberation, is impossible. Knowledge gives liberation, they say that. Knowledge gives the liberation. You are free, basically. You are free already. Not that you will gain moksha. If you have to gain moksha, okay, then now this is a theoretical and you do something and then you become free. It's not a question of becoming free. You are free. It is a to be, the form of a to be, not a to become. And therefore, dropping the notion is the liberation. That's all. Dropping this notion that I am not free is freedom. That is where Mahavakya works. Mahavakya shows of oneness means what? Brahman which is already free is you right now. Asi indicates a present tense. Present tense means you, it, it don't, it does, you need not have to wait. It, it, you, you don't postpone. Shastra does not postpone. You don't postpone moksha. That's very essential. Anyway, so we'll have, I mean, uh, uh, we should have that clear understanding regarding this and therefore prefix ni is appropriately used. Upa means Brahman, which is nothing but me, you or me, I and well, because Upa means uh, near. Near to me is this Brahman, which is non-separate from me. And Ni means a clear understanding. So Upa plus Ni is equal to clear understanding of Brahman, which is non-separate from me. And what it does now, now bring that sun. Now bring that sun. And therefore, so Anadi Gatatam, now you can understand very well. So this... Um, the clear understanding of uh, well Brahman which is non-separate from me that this knowledge this kind of an understanding you will not get by any other means of knowledge and therefore Vedanta is a Satantra Pramana it's an independent means of knowledge because Anadi Gatattam of the definition of Pramana applies very well here Anadi Gatattam Anadi Gatattams means uh, the knowledge which you cannot arrive at by any other means of knowledge, then the uh, definition of pramanas is, uh, I mean, appropriate. And that is, that fits very well into uh, Vedanta or Upanishad. And it is Falavat also because now bring Sad. So clear understand, Upava plus Ni indicates Anadigatattva, a clear understanding of the Brahman which is non-separate from me, is brought out by this Vedanta, which we cannot arrive at by any other means of knowledge because everywhere you require Pramata. Uh, without Pramata, you cannot gain any knowledge. And here the very notion, I am Pramata, the Shastra says it is your notion because you, the Pramata, is Brahman, means you are not Pramata. You will have to drop Pramatrutta. You will have to drop Pramatrutta because it is oneness. Oneness means not addition. Oneness is not an addition. Yeah, either of that it stays. And therefore, you basically go to that Pramanam or Vedanta as a Pramata. You go there. And then Shastra knocks off that you are not Pramata. So here Pramatrutam itself is proven as a notion. So that is why we said yesterday, without Pramata, how can I know? If I am not a Pramata, who knows? Except no, he, that doesn't stay here. It doesn't stay here. Because if Brahman is other than you, then you should be retained as a Pramata. Ah, please understand. To know this, which is other than me, definitely I, the knower, is required. But if Brahman is you, then definitely the Pramatrutvam is negated here. So drop the notion, you are Pramata. That's a, that is essential. And that's a, that has an empirical reality. Don't worry. You I, no, Nothing will happen to you. You will... After knowing that you are not knower, still you will be knower. Hey, what are you talking? I am talking proper. <laughs> after knowing, I am not, after knowing that there is no sunrise, yet there is a sunrise day, next morning. Yeah, that's how it is. That is not the mithyatma. It is not a non-existent thing. 
it is because it it will not turn to be shunya not that kind of a thing but you will know that there is something more real as as yourself compared to pramatrutam just go beyond beyond that through mahavakya you will find through analysis that the pramatrutam stands on the very existence of pramata is dependent upon brahman and so you are brahman now instead of saying i am pramata after thorough analysis and enquiry of the mahavakya well i say i am brahman and that is the identity revealed by mahavakya and therefore if pramata it has to know brahman which is separate from itself then pramata is required then without pramata it is impossible to know but the very pramatrutvam itself is here in question and uh, the the truth of the pramata is revealed by the mahavakya and therefore this kind of a thing is not available to any other mean through any means of knowledge therefore anadigatatvam is there and phalavatvam is definitely that sad which has become from the root now it has become a word agent so it wears out and it wears out what undesirable things phalavat ho gaya it it wears out all undesirable things and therefore are very very essential to know undesirable all undesirable fear undesirable unhappiness undesirable discomfort within oneself undesirable feeling uh, lack within undesirable unhappiness undesirable birth death undesirable punya papam undesirable all kartrutvam undesirable big load kartrutvam is a very big load <laughs> all guilt and hurt is born of this kartrutva and bhoktrutva so bhoktrutva undesirable okay don't worry so sad means is a agent agent of wearing out of all these undesirable things and therefore vedanta is not merely an has anadigatatvam but it also serves a purpose it is fruitful phalavat means fruitful and therefore definitely the host of anarthas anartha vratan if you remember in kathopanishad you know in the initial bhashyam it has been discussed very well whole the meaning of the word upanishad bhashakara discusses at a great length so the host of anarthas all that uh, group of whole uh, anarthas of course uh, they go ha but they go but they come back in a, because that's my experience any anartha goes but then they come back also and they they enter through any door if i even the close all the doors eh, these anarthas come from any door even they may come through the drainage line also so sometimes i <laughs> they come and therefore no 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 they they go for forever how can you say because they put an end to yeah that's another meaning visharana and that is first thing wears out but then avasadana avasadana means avasanam avasanam means a death basically avasadanam or avasanam means a death so they put an end to they will never come back they go for good all the undesirable things go for good okay and so this is all negative thing wears out and you know put an end to and they are all negative tell something positive because we want to study out you are very negative and otherwise your veda also will turn to be negative and therefore <laughs> they tell something positive okay positive gamayati gantru sad indicates an agent to make you gamaitru i, I would say i should say gamaitru gamaitru means it will take you it will take you gamanam is a going and basically gama here i mean gati means you know it it's simply reaching or going but here it's an agent so it takes you it takes a jiva it takes a pramata let's say it takes a pramata to the brahman or bah through the mahavakya of course so you and be- brahman become one that is good so brahman is a desire brahman is a sort so not only it removes all anartha vratan all undesirable things it it, uh, it it takes me to the most desirable thing in my life that is brahman everyone desires only this they may not be knowing that's their problem because of their papas etc the people don't understand really 
what what person wants in life is this only and that is called brahman people want people all people are born in this in this world with a single destination of reaching to ishvara that's all whether you accept ishvara or not that's your problem but one uh, knowingly or unknowingly is is you know uh, in pursuing i mean ishvara alone so this is a positive gain and therefore phalavat again phalavat so that is also a phalam so phalavat arthabodakam and uh, anadigatatvam both are said uh, in the, in by the single word called upanishad so upanishad will become the, you know due of course and that i have told you sad becomes shad because of the rule okay now the word upanishad means both you know the self knowledge as well as the text in the form of words that reveals uh, knowledge like you know the quantum mechanics that particular book which has a title quantum mechanics definitely has a subject matter also quantum mechanics same way upanishad the title that book which has a title upanishad whatever it may be you know upanishad whatever but ultimately that uh, content also is upanishad right content is what self knowledge upanishad we have seen that's how the meaning of the word upanishad and this upanishad is otherwise called vedanta vedanta means what vedasya anta hai vedasya anta veda means a body of knowledge or knowledge and anta anta means end oh so vedanta means an end of a knowledge that's how people 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 say end of knowledge means end of knowledge means most exalted knowledge the pujya sami ji said no 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 don't think that way but let's say it is a positional name generally even that also you know we find lot of um, i mean uh, it is not positional means in, in the end portion of the veda end portion that's a positional name but that is also we didn't we don't find ishavasya is in the very mantra section of the um, veda shukla yajur veda mantra section see the, in the veda there are various portions you know first portion mantra and uh, second portion brahmana and then third is aranyaka and in the aranyaka portion the upanishad should be there because vedasya anta so at the end portion of the veda it should be there but is not ishavasya is right there in the first portion ishavasya is a mantra upanishad taitirya is a mantra brahmana upanishad and therefore you find in um, uh, in a uh, different section also i mean what i'm saying is but more or less basically at the end portion of the veda and but and never think when you open the veda means you will find section 1 mantras and after 300 400 pages section 2 um brahmana etc nothing no <laughs> nothing of that sort nothing of that sort then how will you determine that this this particular mantra is a mantra portion or brahmana portion that's all job done by the acharyas abba that's not our job that's not our job it's all mantra 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 pages and pages are mantra 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 and then definitely this part should be taken into mantra section and this is brahmana and etc all they have done and that through that tool called mimamsa so proper analysis of the words etc and then they analyze and they 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 make that kind of a division anyway and so um, of course the brahma sutra also discusses this, this that word vedanta means not a culmination of knowledge or something well that's not correct it is only a positional name in the, at the end portion of the veda in general and subject matter of course of any upanishad is a uh, same self knowledge and so we have you know ishavasya ishakena katha prashna mundaka mandukya tittirihi etc you know very well and so then aitreya and chandogyam cha etc bhradharanikam tatha like that there is a karika in this 10 upanishads are there and all the 10 upanishads have a same subject matter called self knowledge then why why so many upanishad not only 10 there are 108 not only 108 there are 1008 then why why because everyone has everywhere it is same uh, self knowledge then well they are all from different vedas four vedas and therefore 
if you are studying your your own branch of veda definitely it must have minimum one upanishad then the of course the vedic vision of you that uh, as a brahman is should be available to you and therefore in the four vedas there are different upanishads and why but then why you all the time talk about 10 why don't you talk about 108 you start uh, one upanishad today then second and then third and you finish 10 upanishad and then again come back to the of, of uh, one uh, uh, i mean the first upanishad instead go throughout the life 108 upanishad you study why are you not doing that no acharya is doing that why even bashakara has written commentary on 10 upanishads why people ask so many questions like that because they they feel so you out of 100 or 1008 you consider only 10 are important then you say all upanishad has a same self knowledge yeah the word upanishad also indicate that yeah then why you are um, have a such kind of a discrimination that this 10 principal upanishad they call principal upanishad means all our other upanishads are all subordinate what then they have a subordinate self knowledge or what maybe i think one uh, one gives a self knowledge where they talk about a genuine self and other must be talking about a non genuine self etc etc <laughs> no 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 don't worry about it because vyasa acharya ji basically has written sutras uh, pertaining to this ten upanishads of course kaushitaki he has there are sutras for kaushitaki also but bashakara is not written uh, commentary but generally bashakara has taken the um, comment uh, choosing the writing the commentary on ten upanishads because those ten upanishads have been discussed in brahma sutra by vyasa acharya ji general this is general statement huh? don't bring anything to me no 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 sami ji this particular upanishad see this see this <laughs> it is not there so kaushita ki etc i think in brahma sutra there is a discussion regarding uh, some mantra of a kaushita ki and bashakara has not written commentary on kaushita ki that's what my right now my understanding is anyway so this is how bashakara has followed acharya vyasa acharya ji vyasa acharya but when why why vyasa acharya ji is only chosen 10 upanishad are because there were some discrepancy so called discrepancy within the upanishad mantras to resolve he has chosen this 10 ah he cannot choose 1008 to to study 555 sutras you require 10 years minimum 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 10 years then suppose if he writes commentary on 1008 suppose how many sutras and when will you study and when will you complete <laughs> so by the time when you start study you have a black hair and by the time you finish the study you will have no hair and even the teeth have gone and you will be keeping the book nearer and nearer or maybe farther and farther maybe i don't know so this is how it is so it's better understand the the purport of the shastra is basically what the tatparya is one and that is atma is brahman you are brahman the one who comes to me shastra says you are coming to me well i am a means of knowledge and you are a knower but i am telling you a truth about you i am a mirror and i am telling you a truth about you i am showing yourself i am simply a mirror and acharya holds the mirror in a proper way that's very essential mirror is not only important holding a mirror in a proper way also is equally important and therefore acharya and shastra definitely uh, serves as a uh, as a medium where you can see yourself clearly you will get a knowledge of yourself anyway and each upanishad implies a teacher student dialogue and uh, and therefore uh, and if everywhere teacher student dialogue uh, but still you will find each teacher has his own way of looking at the whole thing don't think that he has a new nu prakriyas no prakriyas are fixed sharira tray viveka pancha kosha viveka karya karana prakriya avastha tray prakriya all these are prakriyas are prakriyas they are this are with this prakriyas dakshinamurti has taught and with the same prakriya our acharya has also taught only difference between the two teacher is basically you know uh, the examples would be different language would be different or presenting the matter would be little different that's all that's all but the, the prakriyas are also every teacher will bring out a new new prakriya no 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 
prakriyas are also there. Whatever way they are there in Sampradaya, in the tradition, those prakriyas are employed by all the Acharyas. And but you can arrive at Brahman starting from anything. I mean starting from any starting point would be different. Because Brahman is limitless. You can pick up this really. You can pick up this and arrive at Brahman. Honestly. You can pick up this. Anything you can pick up. Because ultimately everything is non-separate from Brahman. Brahman is limitless and therefore person can start from any, any point and can arrive at Brahman. Therefore, in a teacher-student dialogue, of course, well, every, every Upanishad has a teacher-student dialogue, but everyone has his own way of looking at the whole thing. And Veda thus presents the subject matter from different standpoints through different Upanishads. And then certain topics may be emphasized in one Upanishad, certain topics, uh, other topics may be highlighted in other Upanishad. So you see a few Upanishad uh, from different standpoints so that you understand the subject matter properly. And it's very essential to study where a, a lot of Upanishad. So I mean, it is one, uh, people tell me that Mandukya eva alam. Ah, moksha prapti, uh, moksha pra, prapti artham, Mandukya eva alam. Now, people have told me if you want moksha, then Mandukya is just, it's enough, alam is enough, nothing else to be studied. Therefore, I don't study any other Upanishad. I only study Mandukya. And then I get tired, then I keep a break in between. Then again, after some time, I start again Amandukya. Don't do that job. Don't do that job. Study all other Upanishads, you will get an insight into the thing which will bring a great clarity. When you start a new Upanishad, you find that the, the same subject matter, uh, that Brahman is you, etc., has been presented a little differently and has it has provided it has it has provided you a, a different understanding by which you gain a more clarity because the doubts are all there how many doubts are there i also don't know when i study i will find and therefore don't do that job wherever acharya has written a commentary on that 10 upanishad of course well you can study so this is how the regarding upanishad now name so this to distinguish one upanishad all upanishad has basically self knowledge that's a subject matter and therefore title also is upanishad everything fine then why are 10 upanishads have 10 names so well we say because we give some adjective to that upanishad even though all upanishads have a same subject matter that is self knowledge so prashna upanishad because there you know the six uh, students go to a teacher called Pippalada and ask questions and that six questions and answer is Upanishad. So we gave the name Prashna Upanishad. We means not me. <laughs> the Acharyas have given the name Prashna Upanishad. And therefore, but Swami in Veda it is called Prashna Upanishad. No, huh? Don't think. In that, like, let me see where in this particular Veda where the Prashna Upanishad is there. And you, you whole Veda you uh, see here and there, you won't find the title called Prashna Upanishad. You find some mantras which belong to Upanishad section. That's all it is. That's all it is. You won't find a title called Prashna Upanishad. That is given by the Acharyas, literal Acharyas. And then Ishavasya Upanishad because that name is given to the Ishavasya etc. Well, it because it begins with, uh, it, uh, you know, the, the Upanishad begins with the mantra. Like uh, Ishavasam. Ishavasam idam sarvam yat kinchit jagatyam jagat tena tektena bhunjithaha magrada kasya svidhanam. So the, man, the Upanishad begins with the mantra, um, uh, I mean the word, first mantra, and that word, first word is Ishavasam. So Ishavas. That's how they don't have a big thing in, you know, name uh, Namakaran Vidhi. Not a big ceremony for giving a name. <laughs> that is for children, not for the Upanishad. They just give a name. Even in Brahma Sutra, it is the same way. The name of Adhikaranas, the topics are given just from the first word of the Sutra itself. Adhikarana contains Sutra. So the first Sutra, whatever the name is there, well, I mean the first word. From that, the whole Adhikarana will be called like that. So this is how it is. So anyway, so anyway, Keno Upanishad also, because it begins with the mantra called Keneshitam Patati Preshitam Manaha. Kena prana prathama praiti yukta etc etc so it begins with kena and kena means by what by whom means by whom the whole all the indriyas you know all the sense organs are propelled towards the vishayas etc so 
that is how the word kena is there in the first mantra in the first word is there so that open this upanishad is called kena upanishad but swamiji it is not kena upanishad keno keno upanishad yeah it is because sandhi kena plus upanishad becomes keno upanishad it is a guna sandhi a plus u becomes o and therefore keno upanishad ishavasya upanishad etc etc mundako upanishad so mundak plus upanishad mundako upanishad etc so that is how prashna upanishad so prashna plus upanishad so a plus u turns to o anyway so this is how uh, and bhashakara has this is the only upanishad where bhashakara has written two commentaries you can understand the importance of this upanishad he has uh, written two types of commentaries uh, and so enhancing its importance for those who seek self knowledge one is uh, one commentary is called pada bhashya i mean the commentary based on the words of the mantras and the other is vakya bhashya a commentary based on the theme of the mantra so bhashakara has written two commentaries parallel pada bhashya vakya bhashya commentary based on based upon the words of mantra explaining the words of the mantra and then he thought the let me give a theme of the entire mantra so he wrote another bhashya vakya bhashya this is the only upanishad where you find two bhashya generally bhashakara writes uh, you know a commentary based upon the words of the mantra explaining the every word of the mantra even the word he quotes and then give a meaning etc anyway so this is way it is uh, uh, i mean we have completed the introduction of kena upanishad and uh, i mean from monday we'll start with shanti patha and uh, um, definitely begins the mantras also om purnamad purnamid purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate om shanti 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 hi hari hi om shri gurubhyo namaha hari hi om